Good morning, church family. Uh, thank you, Tanya, for reaching out. And I also want to um, take time to thank my three beautiful friends that are with me this morning, Cassidy, Landy, and Jen. It's always really special when you're in a place where you don't necessarily recognize everyone uh, to see smiling faces of people that you know you love and they love you as well. So thank you guys for being here. And thank you for opening up your church. I'm honored to be able to share just a brief message with you this morning. But before we start, uh, let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for this day. We thank you for your love, for your grace, and your kindness towards us. I pray that as I speak today, uh, that your Holy Spirit will touch the hearts of those in here, that perhaps the stories I share or the Bible verses we read will be relevant, will be uh, timely for someone or everyone in here. God, you are so good to us, and we thank you for your unconditional love. Uh, bless us as we worship together, I pray in your name, amen. So a little bit about me. I graduated with my degree uh, from Oakwood University. It's one of the Adventist universities in Alabama. Um, while I was at Oakwood, I was a student missionary. So I took time off uh, twice, actually took like full time to just do mission work, traveled to different states um, preaching and doing children's programs. We also funded missions to different countries overseas like Zambia, Zimbabwe, Malawi, Mozambique, and Haiti. And I actually want to tell you a story uh, that I heard. I wasn't actually there, but it's a story that members in my organization experienced while they were in Haiti. So what we would do when we would go to different countries overseas, outside of just like evangelism where we're, you know, pre preaching or doing Bible studies, we would off often do medical relief. So we had a physician on our team and also feeding programs, um, which would entail like cooking something relatively basic so we could do a large amount like rice and beans um, for children and people in the community. So there was one day that the team was doing a feeding program and there are hundreds of kids that generally come as you would imagine. And so these feeding programs had been happening over the course of a week. So multiple times, whether it's during the day or multiple times in a week. And on this particular day, uh, the organization, they set out, they started cooking the rice, the beans, the vegetables, and they realized that they had run out of food. After they finished cooking the set, like, so there was a set of food that was cooked, but that they had nothing left. And when they looked at the size of the pot, and they looked at the rice and the beans and the vegetables that they had cooked, they realized they were not going to be able to feed everyone. And they go back again to look at the storage or their storage supplies, and there is nothing left. So the natural thing to do in that situation, of course, is to pray. And so the team, they gather together, and they're like, God, we don't have anything left, but we trust that these children that are your children, you want to give them food. You want them to be fed, not just physically, but spiritually, but also very much physically. And so we are praying that you will move mountains and do a miracle on behalf of these children. And sure enough, they start serving one bowl of food, two bowls of food, hundreds of kids go by and the pot is not getting lower. And they're like, this is, uh, this is impossible. And they continue serving and children continue coming until they get to the very end of all of the children that were there, hundreds of children fed, and there is still food in the pot. And, you know, we read miracles like this in the story where Jesus breaks bread and feeds the thousands with the fish and the loaf of bread. But it's one thing to see it come to life in front of you and to realize that in those spaces when you have nothing left, there's quite enough for God to do exactly what he wants to do. And so the title of today's sermon is Nothing Left. And we will be reading from Matthew chapter 25, uh, verses 14 through 30. You probably know this story. It's the parable of the talents. But before that, I actually just want to be honest about something. I woke up this week, and I forget exactly what day it was, um, but I received the email asking, like, can you please send us your title, your scripture verse, and I was not in the best mood, honestly. Like, I was kind of sad about something, just reflecting on life, and I said, God, how can I speak this Sabbath when I have nothing left, right? And I just stay there in, like, reflection with God, and I repeated it again, like, how can I speak, God, when I have nothing left? And God said, because nothing left is quite enough for me. 
You see, I've been a student missionary from the time I was 17, and I'm not, I mean, I'm barely 32, but that's still more than a decade of, like, serving and giving. And there are times, if you've ever, like, truly done mission work for a consistent amount of time, um, where you just get burnt out. You feel like you've tapped out, like you've given everything you, you can. And or in your personal life, maybe there are seasons where you're like, God, honestly, I need you to come through for me because I don't have anything left to give. And that's where I felt like I was earlier this week and where God met me. He met me there and reminded me that he's never left me. And so as I was preparing for the sermon, like, God, what do I talk about? And I'm experiencing this very, like, real and raw sense of, like, I'm tired. I've been trying for years, Lord, and it feels like I have nothing tangible in my hand. The parable that came to my mind, strangely, was the parable of the talents. And so let's read it together. I can read in your hearing. Um, and I, I'm using the NASB. Sorry, I have to switch translations. <laughs> um, I can read from the screen. No. Okay. Again, the kingdom of heaven... For it is just like my, it just switched midway. <laughs> For it is just like a man about to go on a journey. And in another translation, it references like the kingdom of heaven. And if you know, in like the New Testament, a lot of times the way that Christ taught, he would give like a parable about what the kingdom of heaven is like. So this is another parable that kind of explains what the kingdom of heaven is like. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves or servants and entrusted his position possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, according to his own ability. And he went on his journey. Immediately, the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who had received two talents gained two more. But he who received the one talent went away dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled the accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted, me, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And in another um, translation, it says, let's celebrate together. Verse 22, and also the one who had received two talents came up and said, Master, you have entrusted two talents to me. See, I have gained two more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one who also had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid and went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. But, the master, but his master answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered, scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank, and on my arrival I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore, take, take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents." And the punchline basically says, For to anyone who has, more shall be given." And he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does, does have shall be taken away. Throw away the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And as you, I'm sure, can imagine, we just read through a long passage. Um, but as you can imagine, there are many applications we can learn from this message. But today we're specifically addressing the topic of nothing left and how I felt like God spoke to my heart this week using this parable. So some of the points that I want to point out is, first and foremost, God entrusted, in this case, uh, the master entrusted his servants with his possession. 
Like he entrusted them with a gift almost. And the first question I want to challenge you with is, do you know the thing that God has entrusted you with? Is it your career, your, your family, your spouse? Is it your story? Like, what do you believe God has given you? Because as we see in this parable or in this narrative, everyone received something. Everyone received something, and to the gift that they received, they had a duty to invest it back in order to, to cause it to multiply. So the question that I want to ask you today is, have you sat with yourself and really asked, God, what is it that is in my hand? Like, what have you given me? And undoubtedly, there are different seasons when we have different gifts. So when I was a student, the thing that was entrusted in my care was to be the best student I could be. One day, if I have, uh, get married and have kids, my children will be entrusted in my care. My husband will be entrusted in my care. When I have my career, that will be entrusted in my care. And the whole purpose is whatever it is that God has given me, that I, I take it and I don't hide it in the ground. But instead, I do something with it in order to glorify my master. So the first question I want to ask you today is what is in your possession and what are you doing with it? The second thing that I want to point out is it didn't matter if they were given five talents, two talents, or one talent. Whatever they were given, once they invested it, it was multiplied. And I think that's really comforting because sometimes, especially in the church setting, we can look and say, mm, this person seems to be far more talented than I am. They seem like they're doing such a great work for God. Maybe they can sing, they can preach, they can do all of these things. But the, the key thing here wasn't the amount of talents any of the servants received. It's what they did with the talent. And so going back to that initial question of like, what has God entrusted to you? It doesn't matter if you feel like it's grand. It doesn't matter if you feel like you are doing something to change the entire world. It's more important what you do with the gifts, gifts God, God has given you than how many gifts he has given you. Because notice he didn't look at the servant that had two and compare him to the servant that had five. Instead, he rejoiced with both of them saying, well done, good and faithful servant. So Take comfort in the thought that, like, I know we can all struggle with, like, I don't have enough or I'm not as talented or as capable. I don't think the question or the concern should be that you are as capable as someone else. But the, the key point, the thing we should focus on is that God has entrusted us with something and he wants us to do with, he wants us to use those gifts, whatever it is, to glorify his name. And that should be a comfort because you can't go wrong. Whatever the gift is for you, maybe it's cooking. I love cooking. Baking someone bread is an act of love. You know, like cooking a good meal is an act of love. Or smiling at someone. You don't have to be able to sing, preach, and teach to be a minister of the gospel. You can just be hospitable or kind or brilliant. Whatever it is that you have in your care, God is honored when we return it back to him by investing. Um, another key point that I want to po uh, point out is that this, again, goes back to the idea of nothing left. What really stood out to me as I reflected on this is if you think about the servants in the narrative, right? There was a servant that had five talents. The second servant had how many talents? Two. And the third servant had one talent. The, the first servant, he immediately went out and invested everything that he had. And the second servant did the same thing. What God pointed out to me to this week that really like touched my heart is at some point, both the servants that chose to invest, there was a moment in time where they had nothing left to give because they took all that they had been given and they invested it. Right? So they had nothing in their possession. If you think about, like, I don't know, investments today, or if you think about, like, giving your money away with the thought of it coming back or being returned, like your ROI, your return on investment, at some point you let go of what you have in the hope of what will come back. And so what God showed me this week that I thought was so special was maybe don't look at it as I have nothing left to give Maybe rephrase it to like, I have invested all that I have. And that 
I, I'm a writer, and so I love language. And the way language shifts our perspective, the way words can change our outlook is absolutely beautiful to me. So shifted my perspective from God, I have nothing left to give, which is a negative thing. Like, I'm worn out, I'm tired, I'm done. To God, I have invested everything you have given me, which is a very positive experience. Like, God, I've worked on what you have presented to me. Really allows me to consider the second half of the story. When it's God, I have nothing left to give. The second half of the story is like there's emptiness, there is a lack, there is scarcity. But when it's God, I have given all you've given or I've invested all you've given to me, the second part of that story is I trust that you will return it. I trust that it will come back to me. And that's what we see in this parable, that those two servants that were faithful and they gave everything they had, they invested the five talents and the two talents. At some point, they could say, yeah, I have nothing left to give. But that was a space of honor. And then the space between your investment and your return on investment is a space of faith. It's a space of trusting that God will honor everything you've done. So I want to make it a bit practical. I, in my life, uh, the story of my life is I am actually not American. I was born in Jamaica. Um, and my family, we came here when I was about five. So uh, my parents or my dad was a coal porter in New York. So we came from Jamaica to New York. And we were in the process of like all of the legal paperwork. However, my father, he got in a car accident, which meant that he had to stop working. So the legal paperwork completely stopped as well. And that kind of alter the trajectory of my family's life because then we were in America as somewhat like undocumented immigrants. And it wasn't something that we intended. Like we did everything the right way. Like, you know, we did the paperwork in Jamaica. We were, the conference was sponsoring us and we found ourselves in a position of like, oh man, what do we do? We don't have anything back home in Jamaica. Uh, my parent, my little brother was born here at that point. So we couldn't just go back to Jamaica. It wasn't that simple. And so for the, the majority of my life, I grew up not really being able to do a lot of things because we were consistently battling with our immigration situation. And to, to like give context to that, um, yes, I have my degree in biology. I was pre-med, but the, it took me eight years to get my four-year degree because I could only do it with sponsors. And so, so much of my life was spent watching all of my peers move forward. You know, like all of my friends now, they're physicians. Or like the, yeah, the, the friends that I went to college, they're, they're attendings, they, they did med school, they did residency, and now they're actual doctors. And sometimes I'm like, God, what do I have to show for anything I've done the last 10 plus years of my life? And um, so I watched my friends move on. And so I, medical school, it didn't matter if I got into the school. Getting in wasn't the problem. So med school, nursing school, like getting in, but never finding the funding because, again, it's really hard with my status. And so life has felt like this, just a string of almost disappointment sometimes where I've invested the energy. You know, like I studied just like they did. I applied just like my peers did. I've worked hard just like they did. But because of circumstances outside of my hands, it didn't quite work out. So what do we do when we get to those positions where it just feels like it's one disappointment after the next? And maybe you can't relate specifically to my narrative, but I look at you today and I know without a shadow of doubt that each of you can go to a place in your mind where it's something is unsettled, where something is still broken, your heart hurts, you're still praying for it, you're still disappointed over it. So as I'm telling my story of disappointment, you can, you can also just like replay your own story. And maybe you like me have sat like with tears in your eyes like, God, I'm doing my very best. Like, I'm trying, you know, even, even with, like, being a writer, um, not necessarily the most stable position, um, but, like, it's something that I feel like God has called me to, so I'll honor him with that. And there are seasons where I'm like, man, I see all of my pairs, and they're thriving, and it feels like I'm giving so much, and I'm barely making it. God, why is that? How is that fear? Why does this hurt so much? And again, maybe this is where you are immediately, or maybe you will find yourself in a position where you feel like you have nothing left. But as I was talking to God this week, uh, because there was a 10-year reunion at my university, 
um, actually it was specifically the group that I did mission work with. It's been 10 years since we all took a year off of school and did mission work. And I was like, man, God, I feel like as I reflect on the last 10 years, I have nothing tangible to show that I've like absolutely given my best. And God said, well, again, consider this. Consider that what you consider, like you, you're saying that you have nothing left to give, but from my perspective, I am just proud that you have invested every talent, everything that I've given you, I am proud that you have invested that for the last 10 years. And I want, in this story, if you think about it, the person that had five talents versus the person that had two talents, it would take the person that, have, that has five talents longer to invest it unless like they got lucky and invested it in one place. But just, just for all intents and purposes, let's imagine that the person with five talents had to go to five different locations to invest it. That would take more time than the person that had two. And to that, God reminded me that sometimes when it feels like things are taking longer than others or you are disappointed by the timeline, maybe it's because you have more to invest. Maybe it's because there is more work that I want you to do. But to that, something God also, I think, has shown not only on a micro scale in my life, in the lives of those around me, but on a grand scale, the extent, to the extent that we wait, like, it will be proportional to the blessings that we receive. For example, we all wait for the second coming of Christ, right? Like, we wait for that. We hope for that, for the day when we won't turn on the news and another child is dying or lost for the days when wars and rumors of wars won't fill us with anxiety. And for the, to the extent that we are waiting for Christ, I believe when Jesus comes and when we get to go home and the Bible tells us like heaven will be far greater than we can imagine. So in those seasons of waiting, just think that whatever it is you're waiting for, when you receive it, it will be worth the wait. I truly believe that. It will be, you will look back and say, it was difficult to wait, but this gift supersedes my expectation. And that was the case with the talents. The one who had five, not only did he invest it, get five back, but he also received the talent of the person who was negligent or unwilling to invest. And all of these statements or all of these conclusions about this parable really are meant to fill us with hope. In those seasons, when we feel drained and burnt out, when we feel afraid and exhausted, there is a promised return that God has spoken to us and over our lives. Nothing lasts forever. No season, no pain. It won't last forever. And God sees us. He sees us. He sees the, the tears we cry at night. He sees the life of disappointment. Um, to that, to the idea that God sees the life of disappointment, I will say that although I feel like in my short life, I've had to watch so many people move on. I've had to beg God for, like, grace or to open doors. I actually have this, like, I have this, I, I don't even know what to call it. I don't know if it's, like, audacity to believe that when it's all said and done, I will not want to change any part of my story. Like, I really believe that despite the failures and disappointments I've experienced, e I can even say that about, like, where I am now. Like, I still see the goodness of God every day. I still know that God has a plan for me that is beyond my wildest expectations. So even though, yes, I faced disappointment, as I've prayed and reconciled it with God, like, I still think my story ends really beautifully. And, and, and it is beautiful right now, even in the midst of uncertainty. Because, yes, I'm in that place like the first and the second servant where I feel like God has given me different gifts. And to be fair, I want to mention that the greatest gift that any one of us has is not a financial gift. It's not the gift of a partner. It's really the gift of our own story. It's the gift of who God has been in our lives despite our shortcomings, despite our pain and our failure, our joys. That is something that no one else has. You alone carry the heart of God through the perspective of your story. And so, again, this goes back to the idea that if you're like, oh, I'm not talented enough, that's not, that's not true, first of all. But second of all, you have a story. You have something that you can tell that will show another person who God is, the goodness of God. And so we all have the gift of our story. And I hope that you never, if there is one thing that you take away from today is that you should know that you have the gift of your story. And maybe you don't feel confident speaking or writing, but 
um, you can live that story out in a way that honors God to those around you. So don't hesitate to embrace your story because in the midst of your story, God is found there. Um, so I, yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's the key point. Take that one away, <laughs> that God is in your story. And so it may be uncomfortable. Like, again, I look at you and I know exactly nothing about you. But isn't it beautiful that I don't have to? Like, I stand up here a complete stranger, but God sees you and knows every moment of your life. Not just what has happened, but what will happen. And he's there. He's there in the darkness of our disappointments. He's there in the heaviness of our heartbreak. He's there when we've lost a loved one or a child. When we get let go of a job. When school doesn't pan out, I am still very much praying to go to school. Like, that is, like, the thing that I'm laying before God now is, like, I want to go back to school. My ultimate goal is to be a professor in theology. So, like, that, I'm like, God, I trust that maybe it will take another five years or ten, but I'm leaving this at your altar. And until that works out, I will keep investing with what I have right now. And so God sees you and he knows you. Um, I want to, as, like, we come to a close, I want to, this week I was talking to my dad uh, just another thing, my dad went blind about, I would say it's maybe like eight to ten years now. Before that, he was like the strongest guy in the world, and I'm not saying that because he's my dad. Like, he really was, and he cooked. This is why I love to cook. Like, they, my parents owned restaurants, like, you know, doing whatever they could. And so I love to cook because it, I feel close to my dad. And Jamaican cuisine is phenomenal. You should try it. Um, but I was talking to my dad, um, and I was telling him exactly this. I was like, Dad... Have you considered sharing your story with people? Because, because you're physically blind, you have a different experience with faith. Like, you never get to walk by sight. Not anymore. My mom is the one that has to take, like, if they're out in public, she has to take him to the restroom. And my dad was like, yeah, you know, like, we were just kind of, like, reflecting on what it would look like for him to just be honest about how hard it's been to tr transition from just fully autonomous to now dependent on anyone and everyone around you. And so we were talking about what faith looks like from a tangible sense. And um, because of that, we started on the story uh, of Elisha when he had his servant. And, and there were, like a battle was about to ensue and they're surrounded by all of the enemy and the servant is so scared and he comes to Elisha and is like, we are about to lose. And Elisha prays to God, like, open the eyes of my servant. And what happens? God opens his eyes and he's able see, to see that, the, that there are chariots and angels all around and that who's for them is greater than who is against them. And I think that's such a beautiful promise and actually the prayer that I'm clinging to now with my narrow-sighted or my short-sighted vision, all I know is today, I can think of the things that I'm like, ah, oh, God, it's still not working out. I can think of the areas that cause me to say I have nothing left. But the prayer I want to pray over each and every one of us today is that God would open our eyes, that we'd be able to see that in those circumstances that feel constricting, that feel like we've come to the end, the things that feel like we are limited or closed off, we will be able to see it through the eyes of heaven and see that the God that fights for us is so much greater than anything against us. And when we feel like we are burnt out and tired, you know who's on your side? God. And when we feel like we have nothing left to give, consider that God is honored and proud that you've invested your talents and your time into his work. And that he's, not, like in the story of the parable, he rejoiced with the faithful servants. Consider that there is a celebration on the, like it's, it's pending. God is getting ready to celebrate with you. And maybe this is a, in a tangible way, like maybe you've prayed for something very physical for a long time. But if not, at the very least, we have an eternal celebration, which is heaven. But I also pray that the thing you are asking God for, a partner, a job, healing, whatever it is you feel like you've invested so much into, that you will see the return on your investment in the form of a blessing that exceeds your expectation. My prayer for you today really is that God will open your eyes, much like he did Elisha's servant, that you will see that you're not alone in this, that it's okay to feel tired, but also that it's honorable to have invested your life 
your, your heart into the service of the Lord, into being who God wants you to be. And we can pray this together because I told you my unfinished story. I still don't know how I'm going to get to school just yet. But we can pray this together, that we will see God do for us what we can't do for ourselves. And that when we hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant, we will honor him by sharing who he is and who he has been to those around us. So we all have talents. Maybe it's not uh, singing or art, but you have the talent and the gift of your life, of your story. We all get to those seasons where we feel like there is nothing left. But as the story reminded us in the beginning about the, the feeding in Haiti, God didn't need anything from us except for our willingness and our heart. And to that, he can multiply it in ways we can't imagine. And ultimately, I pray that we all see life through heaven's eyes, that we see those things that keep us, us, keep us up at night, those fears, our consternation, the things that really weigh us down, that the God who is fighting for us is far greater than anything that stands against us. And that's a comfort we can take with us today, tomorrow, and hopefully for the rest of our lives. So if you have nothing left, I challenge you to believe, like God said to me this week, that what you consider to be nothing, God considers to be more than enough. And he can do things on our behalf and through us more than we could ever imagine. And so let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We thank you so much for the Bible that really serves as an anchor point and a gateway to understanding your heart for us. God, I don't know everyone in here, but I know that all of us in here at some point had a dream. We had hopes, we had ways, that, or we had an idea of what we wanted life to look like, and I'm sure we've all faced disappointments. We've all wondered, why is this taking so long, or why does this hurt so much, or why is this not working out? We've all, at some point, I'm sure, felt like we have nothing left to give. But as we see in the parable uh, with the talents, God, when we faithfully invest, there will be periods where we feel like we have nothing left to give. But that's not a sign that the door is closed or that you have forgotten us. It's a sign of trust and faith in you to return the investment that we've put forward. God, I pray for the people here. I pray for all of their hearts. I pray for the thing that uh, feels heavy for them to carry right now. I pray for joy beyond their comprehension, and I pray that they will see uh, their situation in a way that glorifies you. And ultimately, as I said, my favorite point of today, I pray that we will all understand that we have the gift of our story, and we can honor you by living and sharing it with those around us. Thank you for each person in here, and please bless everyone for the rest of the Sabbath. I pray in your name. Amen.